from compact functional description. Thanks, Amit. So this is joint work with Prabhanjan. So let's rewind back to before 2013. Uh, Cryptoland, I mean, it was a nice, beautiful place, right? We had accomplished so much. Uh, you know, we could do information 3D crypto. We still can. Uh, you know, we, we accomplished public encryption, zero knowledge, MPC, signatures, even ABE, and even FHE, right? Beautiful, I mean, uh, amazing works, and uh, I mean, something we should be really proud of. And they're all still very active areas of research. Right? But then in 2013, uh, this happened. <laughs> Indistinguishable defuscation came around and uh, all hell broke loose. Yeah. So one active line of research that has emerged uh, since then is essentially building crypto from IO, and usually some other assumption like one function. And this uh, pretty much started from the work of Gorg et al. and then popularized by Sahai and Waters. Um, and there have been many, many, many works since then. Uh, if you look closely, they're all you know encoded in there. Uh, but just to give you a sample, I mean, Functional encryption, deniable encryption, round optimal MPC, and so on and so forth. You know, even impossibility results, as we saw in the last talk. So, so this has all been great, but uh, this begs a question. You know, how about the opposite direction, right? How about building I/O? So, the current state of affairs is essentially this. If you look at it, I mean, all the solutions that we know, or all the candidates for I/O that we know, rely on multilinear maps. Right, so you can kind of roughly categorize them in two, in two different areas. Uh, one, uh, there's a sequence of works that uh, show how to get I.O. and sometimes even VBB, virtual black box obfuscation, uh, in the ideal model, where you assume that the, uh, that the adversary is, uh, is, is, uh, is in the ideal model. Uh, on the other hand, there are also a couple of more recent works uh, by Pass et al. and Gentry et al. who make some more concrete assumptions on multilinear maps and then show how to get I.O. Okay. Amit talked about the, the second work on the first day. So I'll not go into any details of this. Uh, let me just put them all together as you know, a sequence of works uh, that make some assumptions on multilayer maps uh, to get I.O. Okay. So I want to claim that this is a somewhat unsatisfactory state of affairs uh, for multiple reasons. One, it, I think it's fair to say that our understanding of security of multilinear maps is still, uh, is still at a very early stage, and this is evidenced by several recent attacks on multilinear maps. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other is uh, we would like to just understand uh, the complexity of crypto, uh, of IO in, in the crypto zoo, right? Where does it stand? How does it relate to other, other primitives? Um, and uh, you know, uh, it would be nice to have some balance. You know, we have so many outgoing arrows from I/O. It would be nice to have some incoming arrows as well. So, so on that front, uh, we do know one implication from uh, multi-input functional encryption to to I/O. Um, I'll talk about what is multi-input functional encryption more in more detail later, but you can just think of it as a generalization of functional encryption uh, to multiple inputs or computing over multiple ciphertexts. So one could argue that in its most general form, multi-input functional encryption is in fact as powerful, if not even more powerful than I.O. So it's not really clear how much light it sheds in terms of uh, basing I.O. On weaker, on weaker primitives. And in this talk, uh, we'll try to make some more progress in this direction by getting I.O. from uh, a single input functional encryption, or a specific fo uh, form of it that we call compact functional encryption. And we'll do this via the route of uh, multi-input functional encryption. Let me just uh, add a disclaimer right away that this is not a candidate construction. All known uh, constructions of compact functional encryption uh, already rely on I.O., but uh, there is nothing to say that this is inherent. We could hope to base it uh, on weaker uh, primitives. We also have another implication uh, from randomized encoding for Turing machines uh, to compact functional encryption. And at a very high level, this is essentially taking a non-compact functional encryption scheme and kind of squishing it down to make it compact. I won't have time to talk about uh, the last one, but in this talk, I'll focus on the, on the top result, going from compact FE to IO. Okay. So let's uh, recall what is functional encryption. So when we think of encryption, it's a very, uh, the standard function, standard encryption, it's a very all or nothing uh, primitive, right? Uh, a sender can send an encryption of some message X to a receiver, and if the receiver has a secret key, then it can decrypt and learn the entire message X. But in certain scenarios, we want more fine-grained uh, control over the, over the data. And functional encryption provides exactly this capability, uh, where now, in addition to sender-receiver, we also have a third trusted party, uh, namely the key generator, who has a master secret key. 
And the receiver can request uh, keys for uh, functions from this key generator, and he will return him a key which is tied to the function f. And now using this decryption key, the receiver can directly learn the output of f on x without learning x. And uh, the security definition is exactly this, that an adversarial receiver should not be able to learn anything beyond f of x, given the secret key for f. So compact functional encryption has the additional requirement now that the complexity of the encryption algorithm should not depend upon the function complexity or the complexity of the function supported by the FE scheme. To make it more precise, we want that the runtime of the encryption algorithm on some input x should only be a polynomial in the security parameter and the size of x. Okay? This is actually a bit too strong. Uh, it would be okay if we have some sublinear dependence on the size of f. I'll mention it later again. But uh, it's, it's just simple to think of uh, complete independence on the size of f. Okay? So main result is uh, IO for p slash poly from sub-exponentially secure public key compact FE. And uh, just to make it more concrete, the security model that we need for uh, the underlying FE scheme is just selective security, and we only want it to support one key query. So this is really the minimal security model that you would want for FE. And uh, I didn't mention, but indistinguishably secure FE. Yeah. If you had adaptive that was only poly secure, is that also enough? Like, can I trade the sub-exponential? Uh, uh, no, no. And uh, let me also mention there's an exciting concurrent work by Nir and Vinod who actually get the exact same result. Uh, superficially, it might look slightly different, but uh, the actual details are pretty much identical. And they also observe uh, that uh, actual sublinear dependence on the size of f is sufficient. You don't need full compactness. And the same observation is true for our result as well. OK, and we also have some other results on multi-input functional encryption and compact FE. I won't have time to talk about them, but uh, you can see them in the paper. Okay, so let me just briefly survey what we know about single key FE in terms of the size uh, of the encryption algorithm. So from just public key encryption, we do know functional encryption schemes for single key where the size of the ciphertext or the running time of the encryption grows with the size of the function. Okay? Uh, if we go on to make assuming LWE, then we can also get uh, uh, encryption schemes where the running time of the encryption depends on the function output length. So not on necessarily on the entire function size, but uh, on the output length. And now to overcome this uh, output length dependence, the only constructions we know so far rely on I.O. So they are fully compact, but uh, they rely on I.O. But let me just point out that these results actually achieve something much stronger than what we need. They support unbounded number of keys or unbounded collision resistance. We don't need it. We just need a single key. Okay. So the obvious open question from our work is uh, constructing compact FE from weaker tools. Um, let me just point out, or I guess uh, just mention that even heuristic constructions for compact FE would be nice. Again, just to improve our understanding of uh, of I/O. Um, and even though our construction uses public key FE, even getting a compact FE scheme, which is secret key, would, again, be interesting just from a heuristic viewpoint. Okay. So let me jump to the technical details. So let me just restate the main result. Uh, what I'm going to show you is how to get a secret key multi-input FE for NRE functions from a public key compact FE scheme. Okay. And why this is sufficient? Because we have this theorem uh, where uh, by Goldbass et al. who show how to get uh, I.O. for n-bit input functions from secret key MIFE for n-array functions. Okay. So let me actually just first briefly recall this theorem. Why, why, why is it true? And then I'll, I'll go to the uh, construction of MIFE. So MIFE is really just a generalization of FE to multiple inputs. Now we have multiple senders who can encrypt their respective inputs and send it to a receiver. And if the receiver has a key for a function f, then it can learn the output of f on all the inputs together. Okay. And the security requirement, again, would be that given this key, he should only learn the output of f on these inputs and nothing else. Right? Uh, let me also just introduce some notation. So uh, for each input and for ci each ciphertext, we'll just associate a position. So for example, x1 will be the first position input. And similarly, uh, the ciphertext x1 will be the first position ciphertext, and so on. And I'm also going to use the shorthand MIFE sub i to denote MIFE for IRE functions. Okay. So let's see how to get IO from uh, MIFE for NRE functions. 
So if I want to obfuscate a function f, then it will consist of two main parts. The first one will be a function key uh, corresponding to a universal circuit which has an encryption of f hardwired inside it. Okay? This encryption is with respect to a standard symmetric key encryption. Additionally, I'll also have two n ciphertexts. Okay? So two for each position two for each input positions, and uh, the top ones denote encryptions of zeros, and the bottom ones denote encryptions of one, and in the first one, I'll also put the secret key to help uh, uh, the evaluator decrypt the encryption of f, okay? And it's kind of intuitive to see that if I want to now uh, evaluate uh, this obfuscation of f, let's say on input all zero strings, then I'll just pick all the appropriate uh, uh, input encodings, right, and then just jointly decrypt them to get f of uh, all zero strings. Right? And just to give you some perspective, uh, those who are familiar with reusable garbled circuits, uh, the reason reusable garbled circuits don't give obfuscation is because, uh, first, the input encoding is private, and second, it's not decomposable. So therefore, if an evaluator needs to evaluate the reusable garbled circuit on an input X, he needs to go back to the garbler and get the encoding of X. Here, because we have decomposability that I can encode each bit separately, I can give the entire input space encoded in a compact form. We're just using two, two n ciphertexts. And now the evaluator can just choose uh, the appropriate encodings for his input and evaluate on his own. Why does it work to just stick the secret key in the first bit? You can put it anywhere, I mean, any of the positions. It's OK. Where does it? So the F has, so the, oh, so, so the key is put somehow for the decryption function. No. But the decryption function composed with F. Yes, so, so what will happen is that uh, when you put the, all these, uh, try to decrypt them with this uh, function key, it will first use sk to decrypt f and then apply f on all the zeros. So, yeah. So the decryption of the symmetric key encryption is, hard, is also inbuilt in you. Okay, so now let me uh, show you how to get uh, MIFE for NRE functions from CompactFE. So the main idea is uh, it's really quite simple. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really true, so le let me try to demonstrate it to you. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is an iterated construction of NRE MIFE from uh, CompactFE. Okay? So what we do is this. We take a secret key functional encryption scheme for singularity. I'll just denote it by MIFE1. And also a public key CompactFE scheme. And then we somehow tie it together so that it gives us MIFE for two array functions. Okay? And then we just repeat the process. We take uh, this two arrays MIFE scheme, secret key. We combine it with a new instance of a public key compact FE scheme. We again tie it together. We get MIFE for three array functions, and so on until we get MIFE for n array functions. Okay? So actual procedure is, is very symmetrical, so let me just focus on the first step, right? how to get MIFE for two array functions, and then you can just repeat the same process. So let me introduce some notation. Um, the triangles are going to denote function keys. Uh, rectangles are going to denote ciphertext. The color red will denote secret key functional encryption. And green will denote public key functional encryption. Okay. I'll have this notation on the next slide as well, in case you don't pay attention. <laughs> so, so I'm going to ignore uh, the key generation process. It will be implicit uh, in, the, in the rest of the algorithms, okay? So let me just start by encryption. So since we are encrypting for two positions, I'll actually, I'm actually going to use two different encryption procedures for each position. Okay, it will be an asymmetric encryption scheme. So for the first position, uh, if I want to encrypt X, I'll just use the underlying secret key functional encryption scheme to encrypt X, okay? Very simple. Uh, to encrypt to the second position, if I want to encrypt some message Y for the second position, I'm going to actually generate a function key for the underlying secret key uh, FE scheme. And this function key is for a function G, which is essentially a re-encryption algorithm. This function G has a PR of key K hardwired inside it, along with the message Y. Okay? And on an input X, it produces for some fresh randomness by applying the PRF on the input X, and then produces an encryption of X concatenated with Y. And this encryption is with, is with respect to the public key functional encryption scheme. Okay. 
uh, key generation is, uh, is also simple to get a key for function f. I simply compute a key uh, for f with respect to the underlying public key f scheme. Okay. And now decryption should be fairly obvious. right? To decrypt, I first take the first two ciphertexts, where one of them is a key and one of them is a ciphertext. Right? I run the decryption algorithm of the underlying secret key FE scheme. So this will give me encryption of X, of y, X and Y. And now I take this function key, the green one, and I run the decryption algorithm of the public key FE scheme. And this will give me F of X comma Y, which is what I wanted. Where did you take the red public key and its secret key? So, sorry, this one here? Yeah, so the, the, the first step, mm -hmm. And that key together to get yeah. X and Y encrypted. Where did you get the key to do that? So this is an encryption algorithm. Oh, so the public key for the public key FE scheme is hardwired inside here in G. Sorry, I should have I skipped that. So the public key for the uh, public key FE scheme is hardwired inside G. So that's why it can encrypt. It's a key to apply the exactly. Key. Yes. So the reason I use this public key is because uh, I want to, if I were using a secret key, then I would need to put the master secret key inside G. OK? And uh, it creates complications. You could try that, but uh, it's not clear how to make the security proof work. So it's just easier. If it's public key, I don't care, right? It's public. But, uh, the secret key is going to function so yeah, you're jumping ahead, but, uh, but even then, I'll, I'll Hopefully, I'll have time to mention it briefly at the end, why, why it's problematic. So do, you need, do you need randomized functional encryption? Uh, no, I'm generating randomness by just using PRFK. Okay. So it's OK. Yeah. OK, so since all the magic is going on in the second step, let's just look at it closely. right? Why is uh, the second ciphertic secure? Right? I mean, I clearly must ensure that K and Y is hidden. right? The PRFK K and the message Y remains hidden. But functional encryption, as is, does not really guarantee that uh, the function key has any hiding properties, right? So why is it the case that k and y is hidden? And I clearly must ensure that they are. Uh, and it, it, it is indeed an issue. And to solve this, we are, you know, as you would expect, uh, going to rely on the notion of function privacy for functional encryption. And uh, very briefly, the notion says the following. If you have uh, two function keys for functions g0 and g1, then if they have the same functionality on a pair of challenge messages, x0 and x1, then these function keys are indistinguishable to a polynomial time adversary. Okay? Now, if you look at this for a moment, it will sound very similar to I.O. And, and indeed, in the public key setting, this notion is, in fact, does give you I.O. Right? And the point is that in the public key setting, the encryptor can encrypt on his own. Right? He has a public key. He can encrypt messages on his own. So you would really require G0 and G1 to be functionally equivalent. And therefore, it will actually give you I.O. But we don't, we don't, we don't need uh, this property in the public key setting. We actually only need it in the secret key setting. Okay? And indeed, in the secret key setting, uh, uh, Brokowski Sekev showed recently the, uh, how to transform any non-function private uh, FE scheme in the secret key setting to any function private one. Okay? And we are going to use this. So this is an unconditional transformation? Um, yes. So, so now that we have taken care of that, we can just repeat the process, right? I mean, uh, uh, now to go from MIFE for uh, IRE functions to MIFE, MIFE for I plus one IRE functions, we'll just repeat the process. For all the first uh, I positions, I'm just going to encrypt using the encryption algorithm of, of the MIFE scheme and uh, of the secret key MIFE scheme. And for the last position, uh, the I plus one is one, I'm going to use a function key, right? And uh, the key generation will be the same as before. And, uh, and now we will need uh, the IRE MIFE scheme to be function hiding, but we can do that. I mean, we can essentially apply the same idea as in the single input setting to get function hiding in the uh, multi input setting as well. Good. So let's first uh, try to understand the, uh, the complexity of this construction, right? I, I mean, so far we didn't see why compactness was necessary, compactness of a fee, so let me try to demonstrate it. Okay. So how many times can we iterate? So let's just quickly recall the construction of I.O. from MIFE for NRE functions. 
so we had this function key uh, for universal circuit with F encrypted hardwired inside it, and then we had these two and ciphertext for each uh, two for each position. Now I'm just I've just written them in our notation, right? Because uh, some of the ciphertext correspond to actually function keys. I've opened up the construction, right? And let's also just quickly recall how now how would we evaluate the sophistication on some input? Let's say all zero strings. Okay, so let's just ignore the bottom uh, encryptions. So the way we will evaluate is essentially by taking the first uh, position ciphertext, running the decryption algorithm for this, right? This will give us an encryption of 0, 0, comma, sk, right? And then we just keep repeating, we'll arrive at, at this. And then finally, we will get encryption of all zero strings, all, all zero strings along with sk. And then we run the decryption algorithm of the public EFE scheme, and we will get uh, the side output, right? So you can see what is happening is that uh, this key here is encrypting with respect to this key, right? These are all different instances of FE scheme, and the ith uh, FE scheme, uh, the ith key is encrypting uh, or producing a ciphertext with respect to the i plus 1th uh, FE scheme, right? So now let's just say that the FE scheme is not compact, right? In that, if that is the case, then the running time of the encryption algorithm that's inside the, uh, inside the function g sub i or g gi at level i, then it depends on the size of the function gi plus 1 at level i plus 1. Right? That's what uh, non-compactness would, would give us. And if this is the case, then we can see that the size will start growing at every level. Right? So if we just did one iteration, of course, uh, you know, this is fine. Now let's say we did two iterations. Then the size of g1 will grow at least by a security parameter. Right? So k times uh, g2. We do one more iteration, it will get multiplied by k again, right? And clearly, after a super constant number of iterations, uh, you know, it will not be efficient anymore. Okay. But if the scheme was compact to begin with, then we won't have this function science dependence, and we can go all the way to, uh, to polynomial in the security parameter. Right, so that's uh, efficiency, and now let's move on to security. So let me just quickly recall first uh, security of multi-input functional encryption. I'll just focus on two every case. Uh, this is sufficient uh, to understand the main idea. So the security game is defined uh, in, a, in a very natural way. We have a left world and a right world. In the left world, the adversary is given, let's say, a key for a function f and two ciphertexts, x0 and y0, for position 1 and 2, respectively. And in the right world, he is uh, given encryption of x1 and y1. Okay, so to start with, I'm just talking about security for one message query. Okay, and in the secret keys, in, since we are in the secret key setting, uh, the number of queries do matter, right? Okay, uh, so security says that if the output of f on x0, y0 is the same as the output of f on x1, y1, then the adversary cannot distinguish between these two words, right? This is natural because the adversary can obviously learn these outputs. So if they themselves are different, then he can distinguish. We want that if uh, that's the only way he should be able to distinguish. Okay? You can extend this definition to multiple queries. So for example, if there are two queries, then now we want uh, that the output of f on uh, four possible combinations here will be uh, the same as the output of f on the corresponding combination in the right-hand side world as well. Okay. Good. So let's uh, start with a very uh, simple and obvious proof strategy and see if it works. So how about just uh, you know, trying to change one ciphertext at a time, right? This is the kind of the obvious thing we do, and typically in proofs. So let's just try to see it. Uh, let me stick to RET2 and uh, two message queries per position. Okay. So what we would want to go uh, do is start from this world where the adversary is given encryptions corresponding to zero challenge message, a challenge bit zero, to, and we want to arrive at this world where he's given encryptions of messages corresponding to challenge bit one. Okay. So let's just do you know the obvious thing. Uh, let's just try to uh, let's say change uh, the ciphertext here in, for challenge query one, okay? So here, instead of encrypting to zeros, now we are going to encrypt the messages corresponding to challenge bit one, okay? And the rest, we just keep the key passes, right? So now I claim that there is already a problem. Right? Consider an adversary who ignores these middle ciphertexts, okay? He just tries to use uh, ciphertext uh, for query one corresponding to first position with a ciphertext in uh, query two corresponding to second position, okay? And uh, note what happens in the first uh, row, right? Here, 
he will get uh, f computed over x10, comma uh, y20. Okay, this is fine. But in the second uh, row, he will get f of x11, comma y20. So he's been able, he's able to actually pair uh, a challenge message corresponding uh, a message corresponding to challenge bit one with a message corresponding to challenge bit zero. Okay. And uh, for this uh, case, the security definition did not say anything, right? I mean, uh, this, in the security definition, we only said that the adversary, if he pairs messages corresponding to challenge bit zero or challenge bit one, as long as the outputs are the same, he cannot distinguish. But now he's able to mix. He's able to do cross computations, and that's a problem. That's really the main problem in proving security of, of multi-input functional encryption. And this is what we want to avoid. So our idea is uh, going to, you know, our idea is to use a different proof strategy. Instead of going over each ciphertext at a time, we are going to go over one input combination at a time. Okay? So if you're talking of IT2, then I'm going to look at all possible combinations, which will be in case of uh, IT2 and uh, query Q, it will be Q squared, essentially, combinations. So I'm going to go over all of them, one at a time. And somehow ensure that the adversary is never able to compute cross terms. Uh, let me be more concrete. So. This is what I'm going to do. So let's, in the left-hand side, I have a ciphertext, Q ciphertext, uh, for the first position. Okay, so since there are Q queries, Q ciphertext for the first position. In the second column, uh, I just have one ciphertext, which is the function key for the second position. Actually, there are Q of them, but uh, you know, it suffices to just consider one of them. Okay. In the proof, what I'm going to do is that instead of putting uh, only the challenge message corresponding to zero or one, I'm going to actually put both of them in uh, both the left column and the right column. Okay, so I'm actually going to encode both x i zero, x i one, and similarly, you know, y zero, y one. Okay. The next step is I'm going to use these uh, query numbers and actually put them inside the the ciphertext. Okay, I'm actually going to encode them inside the ciphertext. Uh, let me just call them indices. On the right hand side, in this function key, I'm also going to add a counter. Okay? This counter is going to be initialized to zero. Okay? And when it's in, in, initialized to zero, in the left hand side, in all these ciphertext, Q ciphertext, the second challenge messages, which correspond to challenge bit one, they're disabled. Okay? The cross is saying that they're disabled. Okay? G completely ignores them, essentially. Now I'm going to use the following rule. Very simple rule that if this function g gets any input from there, any of the q inputs from there. If the index in the input is greater than counter, then use uh, y0. Otherwise, use y1. Okay? And now note that in this first hybrid, uh, the counter is 0, and all the indices are greater than this counter 0. So it is always going to use y0. So this is fine. right? This is what we want it to be. And now, But now we can iterate. Right? Now we can increment the counter to 1. And uh, in the first ciphertext, I will disable the challenge message 0 instead of challenge message 1. Now when I try to decrypt, if I use the first ciphertext, then the counter 1 is, ac is actually equal to, index, uh, uh, to the index 1, and therefore I'm going to use y1. So I'm pairing x11 with y1, which is uh, kosher. Right? But for the remaining ciphertext, since their indices are greater than counter, I'm going to use y0. And this is again good because uh, I'm using the zero uh, challenge messages there. So I'm again pairing zero with zero. Okay? And now I can just repeat this process. right? I can keep repeating this until I arrive at uh, uh, counter Q. And now I'm everywhere I'm using Y1 and pairing them with the, the challenge messages 1. Okay? So this is essentially it. Um, uh, to do this in index increment, uh, we have to rely on function privacy of FE. But uh, you know, this, this is really the gist of the proof. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the compactness was essentially in uh, you know the, just analyzing the size, right? But yeah. Uh, and how many hybrids? Well, if you are doing NRE MIFE, then you will have Q to the n hybrids. Uh, and since for I/O we only need uh, two challenge queries, actually we will have two to the n hybrids, right? And this is why we need the underlying FE to be sub-exponentially secure. So that is uh, really it. Uh, uh, that's essentially the proof. Um, so I don't have a conclusion slide, but let me just say that uh, 
what have we accomplished? Uh, all we have done is uh, shown uh, how to get uh, I/O from compact FE, and really ob the obvious question is to now how to get uh, compact FE from some weaker uh, tools. Um, Again, let me just stress that even getting heuristic constructions would be interesting just to improve our understanding of I.O. Uh, so the search for I.O. is uh, from standard assumptions is still on. Thanks. Probably stupid questions, but when you started to construct in the first place, you, you, you had first encryption and then a one a week, am I uh, I think, right? So, so one area MIFE is the same as FE, right? I mean, it's it's really the same thing. I just just to make the notation consistent, I use MIFE one, but yeah, it's really the same thing. Yeah. So I have questions. So do you think the sub exponential IO is kind of equivalent? Sub exponential FE. Uh, I mean, given our current understanding, uh, you know, this is. Uh, this is really the same issue that comes up in uh, you know work of Amit and friends. Uh, the point is that currently the only way we know how to do proofs is to go over one input at a time. In this case, it was one input combination at a time, and there is you know some uh, argument to suggest that it might be evident. This this might be inherent, but there's no formal proof for it, right? You can try to use uh, come up with a fake meta reduction to show that uh, sub exponential hardness is necessary, but you know it's not a formal proof. Yeah. 